We're now going to move from a study of economics to a focus on politics, which looks more at how the society establishes their rules rather than how they deal with their resources. So how did political liberalism develop? Well, let's look back to the Enlightenment, of course. During the Enlightenment, people started to think about how and why things were organized the way they were. That idea of the divine right of kings was losing its power as people questioned how government and the economy should be run. Many liberal philosophers felt that the individual had a role to play, which meant everyone should have a say in how to govern the country, not just the monarchy. This leads to the renewal of democratic ideas that had been first tried in Athens, Greece, a couple of millennia earlier. That's not to say all the philosophers had the same idea of how a country should be run. Let's review some of the philosophical ideas we discussed way back in the intro to liberalism unit. Locke felt that the only role of government was really to protect individual liberty. He was okay with the idea of a constitutional monarchy. That's a dictator who's controlled by a democratic constitution. Rousseau wanted the general will of the people enforced, so he could, in theory, support a dictator as long as that dictator was ruling in a way that promoted the idea of the consensus that was decided by the group. Montesquieu was the philosopher who helped us see how to protect individual rights and rule of law by separating the different areas of government control. He stated that the people creating the laws, legislators, shouldn't also be the enforcers of the laws, the executive branch or the interpreters of the laws, who's the judicial branch. That way rules could be followed and enforced fairly. And of course there's John Stuart Mill who wanted democracy that protected the rights of everyone, including women, which most other philosophers didn't even seem to give a thought about. Now there's a lot of discussion today about the influence of Aboriginal groups on modern day democracies. The thing is, the first modern day democracy was the United States and essentially all other democracies have referred to the ideas in the US government when they organized their governments. We know that philosophers like Locke had a huge influence on the US democracy, but many influential politicians and philosophers like Benjamin Franklin were impressed with the societies that existed in North America before European settlement. The Haudenosaunee Confederation, also known as the Iroquois Five Nations, was a great example of how to organize groups that had a common interest, but also want to maintain their nation's interest. Each of the nations had control over local issues, but with issues like war, they could work together with other nations to come to a consensus. Hmm, think about how Canada's organized. Province is in charge of their own concerns, but works together with the Canadian government in regards to issues that concern the country. Some other ideas that impressed the American politicians who were writing the U.S. Constitution was the fact that the elder or leader of the Aboriginal groups were often expected to put the needs of the group above their own needs. So unlike a monarch who's in a position of power, the U.S. president is expected to serve the needs of the nation first. So how did the American Revolution start? Okay, well in a nutshell, the colonists in the Americas were adopting the Enlightenment ideas with the importance of the individual. Because they were a colony of Britain, they didn't have the same rights that British citizens had in the mother country. One of the biggest complaints was that the British government would control trade and increase taxes without taking into consideration the wishes of the colonists. Taxation without representation was the rallying cry of the revolution. When the Americans wrote their declaration that they wanted to become independent, this was one of the first lines. Does this sound like the ideas of Locke? Britain refused to listen, so the colonists took up arms and forced the British out of the 13 colonies. There's a little side note here. There's a dangerous precedent contained in the ideas of Locke that a group should be able to rebel against their government. If your nation state was created through violent revolution like the United States was, who are you to say that someone else in the nation state can't now rebel and start a violent revolution to support the kind of state they support? For example, should Quebec separatists be allowed to start a war in order to separate from Canada. Right after the American Revolution, the French, who had helped the Americans win their independence, decided they wanted many of these Enlightenment ideas in their country. So what do you remember about the French Revolution? Were you paying attention in Social 20? Here's the basics. The society was based on three groups or estates. The first and second estate, which made up about 3% of the population, had all the privileges, while the third estate weren't really listened to by the government. When the king called a meeting of the Estates General in 1789 to raise money, the third estate protested to demand more of a voice in government. They used the ideas of the Enlightenment philosophers to support their protest. The king locks them out of the government meetings, so the third estate meets in an indoor gym or tennis court, and they decide they're going to band together and work on creating a form of democracy in France. After a few violent acts, remember the fall of the Bastille, the king gave in to the third estate and allowed them to organize a government. 
At first, this new government did a great job building a society based on the ideas of the Enlightenment. They got rid of feudalism, which was basically a form of slavery. They wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is used as the basis of most rights legislation in Canada, like our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But things got out of control, as the government leaders became more and more radical until the reign of terror kills anyone who doesn't support Enlightenment ideas, which is kind of an oxymoron. The government justified this massacre by saying we must control individuals in order to protect our liberal society. Hmm, doesn't that sound a bit like Hobbes, who said people needed to be controlled? In the end, Napoleon shows up, re-establishes a monarchy, calling himself an emperor, and therefore cancelling out all of those efforts to bring in a liberal democracy. There are revolutions on and off for another half a century, but what's important is the ideas of political liberalism were now established in Europe, and eventually most European nations would adopt the ideas of political liberalism. One final thing, while we usually focus on liberal philosophers during the Enlightenment, not everyone thought liberalism was a good idea. It was the chaos during the second part of the French Revolution and the resulting coup d'etat by Napoleon that led the philosopher Edmund Burke to reject the ideas of liberalism. He felt that all of this focus on the individual only leads to chaos and we can't ignore the wisdom of those who've gone before us. He's what we call a classical conservative because he wanted to conserve the values of the monarchy and the old regime. So now in our next lesson, we're going to look at political liberalism in more detail. In other words, we're going to study democracy.